This is Value Investing. I'm your host, Jun Kim. In this podcast, you'll learn everything related to value investing. Welcome to episode one of Value Investing. I'm so excited about launching this podcast. In this episode, I'll talk about why I'm launching this podcast and what are the objectives that I have I'm trying to achieve through this podcast. And I'm going to move on to the topics related to Warren Buffett. And this is not one of those typical podcasts that talks about general things related to Warren Buffett. I'm going to do the deep dive on the things that you may not have heard of about Warren Buffett. For example, in this podcast, I'm going to talk about how Warren Buffett started his first investment partnership with very small amount of money. And I'm going to do the deep dive into the fee structure that he arranged with his investors. And how does that compare against the fee structure that you see in today's hedge fund industry? And lastly, I'll do the deep dive analysis on the strategies, investment strategies that Warren Buffett used for his partnership at his early career and I'm so excited and let's get started so why don't we get started on the this podcast objective first the reason why I'm launching this podcast is because I was just reading a lot of books related to value investing in the past and I read everything about Warren Buffett I read everything about Peter Lynch and there are many value investors that you can look up to for their investment performance but I haven't found any podcast going into the details about value investing and they talk sort of scratch the surface they don't really do the deep dive analysis of these different uh, value investor aspects so what I'm trying to achieve here is provide value to the listeners in a sense that they can learn quite a lot by listening to this podcast and it's beneficial to me as well because I have to do tons of research before I do this podcast so it's win-win situation where I get to learn a lot I get to do a lot of research and you get to listen to the summary version of my research in this podcast in that regard I'm not going to post podcasts every week because I truly believe that research requires a significant amount of time and if I'm forced to post one po- episode per week, then I don't think that it's going to be good quality. So what I'm thinking right now is planning to post podcasts once every month or once in two weeks. I'll see how it goes, but I'll try to keep posting and add value to the listeners wherever they are. So that's the objective of of this podcast and I'm going to be very casual and I'm going to talk about also my opinions along the way and it's going to be an exciting journey. So why don't we go on to the next topic which is about Warren Buffett and when I first thought about what topic that I need to discuss in the first episode and subsequent episode I just couldn't find a better person than Warren Buffett because he's thought of as the best investor of all time and he's one of the best value investors out there. So what I want to do is go into the details about Warren Buffett and try to understand every single bit of what he have done what he has done so far starting all the way from his investment first investment partnership that he formed in 1957. As you know, Warren Buffett uh, is one of the richest person in America and he didn't really inherit any money from his parents. He started everything from scratch and you might wonder how he did it, how he how he successfully launched his partnership and now he's the chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. So why don't we go back in time and examine how he was able to successfully launch his first investment partnership. In 1957, Warren Buffett started his first investment partnership 
with the money that he attracted from his family members and his close friends. The money he was able to secure at the time was not really a lot. It was about $104,000. In today's dollar terms, that's about $920,000. Still a small amount of money even in today's terms. Because think about how you can run your hedge fund in today's environment with the technology available right now. And back then, Warren Buffett didn't have any, a lot of resources to run his hedge fund, so he had to do everything by himself. For example, so he did everything, uh, all the accounting and taxes by himself. If you want to launch a hedge fund today, then you need accountants, you need technology people, you need prime broker, you need audit people. So there are a lot of things that you have to take care of, and that's going to incur certain costs for your operation. If you have asset under management less than $1 million, then you're not going to be able to survive. You have to be super effective and efficient in order to keep your hedge fund running. So that's quite interesting perspective. And Warren Buffett started out very small amount of money, but he was able to scale up as his investment success got noticed by different investors and more and more money came into his fund. I also want to talk about the fee structure that he arranged with his investors and limited partners. And I want to compare that against that of hedge fund, a lot of hedge funds in today's investment uh, environment. So if you look at today's hedge fund in general, what they charge to their clients and investors is 220, 2% management fee and 20% performance fee. So what it means is if you have $1 million invested in one hedge fund and they charge 2% management fee, they're going to get 2% of that $100 million regardless of invest their investment performance. And as I mentioned, in some cases, uh, it can be justified because it's just expensive to run large hedge fund. Performance fee, as the name represents, it's charged only when the investment fund makes money if investment makes 20 million dollar out of 100 million dollar from that 20 million dollar 20 percent goes to hedge fund manager and 80 percent goes to the investors so that's a typical 220 structure that a lot of hedge funds charge to their clients and what warren buffett did back then is quite interesting and there are a lot of similarities and also differences First, Warren Buffett didn't have any management fee. So that's quite striking. As I mentioned, um, he had to do everything by himself in order to keep the cost down. Second, he charged different performance fees uh, to different limited partners. So for example, he had multiple investment partnerships back then. Later, he consolidated this multiple partnership into one fund but partners were able and investors were able to choose one of the following options the first option is six percent guaranteed interest but 33 percent performance fee second option is four percent guaranteed interest and 25 percent performance fee and lastly no interest payment and 17 percent performance fee so depending on your risk appetite you can choose one of these options and do the business with Warren Buffett. And last thing that I want to mention with respect to performance, uh, with respect to fee structure, is the fact that Warren Buffett also took a hit when his fund suffers losses. So he took 25% of loss of his fund. What I mean by that is if his fund suffers loss, then he has to reimburse his partners about 25% of their loss. So that's very, very risky on Warren Buffett's part because I think that he can easily go bankrupt if he experiences big loss in a given year. But that was the arrangement he made with his investment partners. And we don't find that kind of arrangement in today's hedge fund environment. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. It's just a really risky from Warren Buffett's point.
part to commit that he's gonna reimburse 25% of loss out of his own pocket. So that was the fee structure that I found very interesting and I tried to summarize them here in this podcast. Why don't we talk about the investment strategies that Warren Buffett implemented when he ran his investment partnership in 1957. So one of the partnership investment partnership letter that he sent out, Warren Buffett sent out to his investors shows that he had three different strategies that he was doing for his investment partnership. The first strategy is to buy undervalued securities in the market. And let me just go into a little bit more details. It's just not about buying hundreds of different securities for diversification purposes. What he said is he buys five to six different stocks, each representing or accounting for about 5 to 10 percent of total portfolio asset value so a lot of people it's quite interesting uh, in many aspects because a lot of people and a lot of investment professionals nowadays invest and diverse significantly diversify their portfolio significantly in order to get rid of idiosyncratic investment risk but what Warren Buffett did back then is buying undervalued securities but the number is quite striking it's only five to six stocks that he invested in so no diversification at that time uh, just by just purely looking at the number of stocks that he owned and he thinks uh, that Warren Buffett also stated in the letter that it takes years to work out for these securities so he's not thinking about long short term he's not thinking about one year or two year he said that at least five years are required for a lot of these securities to be materialized and a lot of these security to converge to its intrinsic value and when he buys this under under undervalued securities what he does is perform exercise to calculate and estimate intrinsic value of the security and only when the securities are selling below way below intrinsic value he purchases these shares so that is called margin of safety that he learned from Ben Graham. If you are, have followed Warren Buffett, this is quite famous concept that Ben Graham came up with. And Warren Buffett adapted and used this concept and methodology when it comes to investing. So later, Warren Buffett, as, as you probably know, met Charlie Munger. And Charlie Munger had huge influence on Warren Buffett in transitioning his approach from investing in under significantly depressed securities to buying really good business at fair value so that's some topic that we can discuss in different episodes but that's the transition that Warren Buffett made in later in his life but when he managed his investment fund around this time in 1950s he still focused on finding and identifying undervalued securities. And also what's interesting is the fact that he also mentioned that he's going to sell. He plans to sell when these securities reaches at fair value. So that's not typically what you hear from Warren Buffett in today's environment. Because if you look what Warren Buffett says, he just like to buy and hold and hold it forever. But... That was not the strategy that he implemented at the beginning of his investment career. So this is the first strategy that he implemented for his investment fund. And the second one, second strategy, is what he calls workouts. So what he mean by workout is that he invested in securities that are experiencing some sort of corporate actions or events. For example, mergers, acquisitions, and spin-offs, reorganizations, and liquidations. So this is the securities that may not be sensitive to market movement and may be tied to certain timetable. So Warren Buffett made certain bets on these securities and he was willing to also use leverage against the total asset that he had. 
And this is also quite interesting if you have regularly followed Warren Buffett, he doesn't like to use leverage whatsoever. But for this specific situation, he said that in his investment letter that he can use maximum of 25% leverage, the debt, against the total asset that he has in order to pursue the opportunities in this space, corporate event securities space. He was a either different person, but um, he thinks uh, the rationale why he thought about using the leverage and why he leave that opportunity open is because he thinks that this is reasonable this is going to create reasonably stable earnings from year to year and they are not sensitive to the general market so which is also good and he didn't fur- uh, further explain but that was the rationale that he laid out in the letter the last strategy that he mentioned in his letter is the control situations. What he meant by control situation is that he can accumulate a large portion of ownership in certain securities and take control of the entire firm. And he can influence policies of the company and he he can exert some influence on the management and change their investment strategy or operational strategy and make changes basically for the firm and resell at a high price. So it sounds quite familiar to the strategies that you see in today's world in private equity firms. So Warren Buffett was doing sort of hedge fund strategies and private equity strategies and buying securities in the market. So he was able to do all these three different strategies back then, I assume, because he was not the investment community and firms were not as regulated as uh, the firms today. So maybe he was able to have this kind of flexibility back then. That was the research that I have conducted for the first episode. I just think that there is just so many materials that I can cover in the subsequent episode. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spend enough time to do a lot of research and to know about everything about Warren Buffett for the first, I assume, 10 episodes. And I can move on to different legendary investors like Peter Lynch because I just think that there are just things, uh, numerous things that I can talk about and it's going to add a lot of value to listeners. And that's what I'm planning to do. I hope you really enjoyed uh, this podcast. Please leave your comments wherever you're listening to your podcast. I think I really appreciate your time. Thank you.